we come to the time that we do quarterly, pretty much, to remember what God did for us, what God the Son did on the cross. I want to ask a question this morning. Do you remember? Been, been to some class reunions the last couple of weeks, and memories sometimes fade. Memories sometimes get distorted. And sometimes, if we can't remember, we just make it up. The reality is, God's Word is not made up. God's Word is God's Word. And those ministries that we have looked at in God's Word, the miracles in God's Word, but most of all, the redemption in God's Word is not made up. This morning, we're going to remember what it means. We talk about the broken body of Jesus. We talk about the shed blood but do we really focus on that? Do we really comprehend what it means to remember his broken body, to remember his shed blood? This morning, we're going to take a few minutes and try to remember that and try to focus on that so that as we partake with the Lord's Supper, we're remembering what is truth. We're remembering what is true. And we remember who is truth. So this morning, if you have your Bibles, turn to Luke chapter 22. We're going to read about the institution of the Last Supper or the Lord's Supper. And then we're going to look at what do we remember and how do we remember it. When you have found Luke chapter 22 and verse 14, if you would please stand as we honor the reading of God's Word. Begin reading in verse 14. The Bible says, When the hour had come, he sat down, and the twelve apostles with him. Then he said to them, With fervent desire I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say to you, I will no longer eat of it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. Then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And he took the bread and gave thanks and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Some translations say this is my body broken for you. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood which is shed for you. Father, as we consider the, the broken body, the shed blood, Lord, help us grasp the magnitude of what you did for us on the cross. And Father, as we grasp that, Lord, help us to never forget, but to always remember that we belong to you because you died for us. You paid a price that we could never pay. Now, Father, I pray you take me out of the picture and just let our hearts understand, based on your word, what we need to learn today. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. Now, the broken body, something that's interesting, and sometimes we think of a broken body as broken bones. But the Passover feast was celebrated, and they never broke a bone in the lamb. Now, they may have taken it apart of the joints. They, they obviously cut the lamb. But there was not a broken bone. And when you think of crucifixion, the crucifixion that the Romans perfected, there was always a broken bone, or virtually all the time. Especially if the crucifixion was later in the day <clears throat> and the people had not had time to die. Because you see, as a crucifixion, when somebody hung on that cross, in order to get a breath of air, they had to raise up because their diaphragm was being pushed down by all the organs of the body. And as, as the prisoners hang, hang, hung on that cross, that hanging caused them to not be able to breathe. So the people on the crucifixion didn't really die 
from hanging on that cross except they died of suffocation because hanging on that cross did not allow their diaphragm to lift up enough to breathe unless they pushed up. And imagine, if you will, having two, your feet together and a spike driven through your feet and trying to push off those broken foot, that broken foot, or not broken foot, that foot that went between the bones. Imagine having even a sprain. Think about the last time you bumped into a chair in the middle of the night with your toe. How much that hurt, how hard it was to put any pressure on it. You walk funny, didn't you? Because it's painful. But even more painful is those, that spike in between the bones that separated the bones of the ankle and went in to that tree. And as they stood up, there was always that pressure and that movement of those bones, and it was painful. The reality is that's what the person had to do was to raise themselves up in order to breathe. And most people died of suffocation. But if it was late in the day, the guards would look up and they'd say, we're going to make sure that they didn't just pass out. And we're going to break their, the lower bones of their legs so they can't run off. And they were very good at that. They would take a, a rod and put it in between their legs and just pop them. And they would break their legs, break the bones in their legs so that they could not run off. And in reality, it was amazing, and it was by God's providence that Jesus' legs were not broken. And they did plunge the sword, or the spear rather, up under his ribs, into his heart cavity, and the blood came out from his heart, and the water surrounding that, cav that, that heart, that cavity of, of water that had accumulated it all came out blood and water at the same time but think about his broken body in Isaiah chapter 53 the, the, the picture emerges of what Jesus went through the Bible says but he was wounded for our transgressions because we sinned they wounded Jesus he was bruised for our iniquities he had wounds he had wounds on his body where they beat him with a rod. The Bible talks about the fact that they put a crown of thorns on his head. And they began to take a, a rod and just hit that crown of thorns. And as you well know, that that crown of thorns would pierce his skin and tear his skin. And somebody pounding on that would cause great wounds. And then... They literally blindfolded him. And then one by one, the soldiers would come up and they'd hit him with their fist and say, if you know everything, tell us who hit you. He was bruised. Folks, you know what a bruise looks like when somebody hits you in the face or you run into the corner of a, a, a door. The reality is not only was he wounded, he was bruised. The Bible says the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. We deserve that cat of nine tails. And by the way, that means spiritually healed. It doesn't mean physically healed. Because they, the lictors were trained. They practiced a great deal. And the badge of honor of the best ones could go 39 lashes and the person would be at the point of death. But 39 lashes was prescribed to be able to take a person 39, hit, hit a person 39 times and still survive. They said, well, I, I've seen canings. I know in Singapore one time they had a big to-do about a guy who was caned. You see, this is a little different. They had a rod about this long with long strips of leather the end of that leather, they'd put sharp bones, they'd put rocks, they'd put glass if they had it, metal, anything they could put in there, they would tie it on the end. And that lictor, if he was very good, he could take that lictor and he could take a swipe and pop it just right. And it would not only bruise the skin, but it would literally rip the flesh from the skin. It's been said that 
Many of those prisoners, when they got those 39 lashes, their insides, was wide, their ribs were exposed because those cat and nine tails will reach around and grasp in the front and pull back. And they could do that and they would go from side to side. And they were very skilled at using all those sharp rocks and sharp bones and sharp glass and sharp metal to literally tear the skin from a person's back, side, even around front. That's what Jesus went through because he went through it. We didn't have to go through it. We're not allowed to go through it because he went through it for us. He was oppressed. He was afflicted, the Bible says. Yet he opened not his mouth. If you go back and read the account of the crucifixion, not one time did Jesus say, stop, please stop. He didn't say, don't do that anymore. He didn't say, I quit doing what I was doing. He simply took it. He says he took it like a lamb to the slaughter. And as a sheep to the shearer was silent, so he opened not his mouth. Isaiah had that picture of what Jesus was going to go through. And he was so eloquent in telling us that. The Bible says he was taken from prison and from judgment. And who will declare his generation? For he was cut off from the land of the living. For the transgressions of my people he was stricken. For your, your sins and my sins he was taken. And his life, physical life, was taken. He was killed for us in our place. Yet, excuse me, and they made his grave with the wicked, but with the rich at his death. Because he had done no violence, nor was there any deceit in his mouth. You think about that. Isaiah knew that a rich man would give up his tomb for Jesus. Actually, Joseph of Arimathea was the rich man, and, and I kind of sensed that he knew it wouldn't be needed very long. And, and he'd be able to use it himself later on. So it really was, you take, take it for a couple of days, Lord, and when I need it, it'll be there. You see, Jesus went to that tomb. He went to a, a graveyard. He said, well, what's so significant about that? Cemeteries are where lost people are buried. They'll never come out of those graves alive. They may come out, but it'll be for a judgment time. They'll be sent, separated from God for all eternity. Only those who are in Christ, who have appropriated what God has offered us, they'll be able to see him and live with him. Yet it pleased the Lord to bruise him. He has put him to grief. This was not just a bunch of mobsters that took Jesus and killed him. Jesus went willing to do the cross because God the Father said, that's the payment I require for their sins so that we can have fellowship with, with mankind. And the Bible says, it pleased the Lord to bruise him. Now you think about that for a minute. It pleased the Lord to bruise him. That's how much God loves us. He bruised his only son so that you and I could have a relationship with him. And he says he put him to grief. And when you make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed. He shall prolong his days and the pleasure of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Jesus knows Every person here who surrendered their lives to him. He will see all of us for all eternity. Our days are prolonged. Not because we're good or not because we're special. But because God loved us so much that we will never die. Oh, physically, our bodies will give out. Our bodies will, will die. And if you're 
reaching any kind of a milestone in your life, you realize that every year your body is not quite as good as it was. Every year we begin or we continue to deteriorate. Almost from birth we begin to die. But we will never die because when we get with him, eternal life is forever. He shall see the labor of his soul and be satisfied. By his knowledge, my righteous servant shall justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. You and I have been justified. If Christ is living in us, if, if he's taken up residence, and not only taken up residence, but take, taken up reigning in our lives, and we, are, we surrender to him, when we receive this, this Lord's Supper, we're reminding ourselves that he is broken body, paid for the sins that we have. But then there's his shed blood. Verse 20 talks about partaking in the cup and it being about the blood. Ephesians 1, 7 says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Not a works lest any man should boast, but according to his mercy he saved us. It is the gift of God, not of any works. It is the gift of God. It is because of the blood of Jesus. Ephesians 2.13 says, But now in Christ Jesus, you who are once far off have been brought near by the blood of Christ. Not because we become so holy, not because we don't want to follow him, but because of his blood that he shed for our sins we brought near. The old hymn says there's power in the blood. What can wash away my sins? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Nothing can do it. No matter how good we think we are, how good we might be, the reality is it took the blood of Jesus to make us righteous before him, to make us redeemed before our God. Colossians 1.20 says, And by him to reconcile all things to himself, whether things on earth or things in heaven, having made peace through the blood of his cross. We have peace with God because of the blood of Jesus, not because we're nice, peaceful, peaceful people, not because we've surrendered our lives to Christ, but because of the blood of Jesus. 1 Peter 1, 8 through 19 says, Whom having not seen your love, who now you do not see him, yet believing you rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory, receiving at the end of your faith the salvation of your souls. Of this salvation the prophets have inquired and searched carefully, who prophesied of the grace that would come to you, searching that, searching what or what manner of time, <clears throat> the, Son, the Spirit of Christ who was in them was indicated when he testified before the sufferings of Christ and the glories that would follow. To them it was revealed that not to themselves, but to us, they were ministering the things which now have been reported to you through those who have preached the gospel to you by the Holy Spirit sent from heaven, things which angels desire to look into. <clears throat> Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind, be sober and rest your hope fully in the grace that was brought to you at the resurrection of Jesus Christ, at the revelation of Jesus Christ, as obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance, but as he who called you is holy, you also be holy, because it is written, Be holy, for I am holy. <clears throat> and if you call on the Father, who without partiality judges according to each one's work, conduct yourselves throughout the time of your, that your stay here in fear, knowing that you serve, that you are not redeemed with corruptible things, the silver or gold from your aimless conduct received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and spot, the precious blood of Christ. It is his blood that redeems us. It is his blood that brought us near to him. It is his blood that keeps us through all eternity. 
in 1 John 1, chapter 7 through 10. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, the Son, cleanses us from all sin. Did you hear that? The blood cleanses us from all sin. That's what we need to remember. The blood cleanses us, not our works, not how good we are. The blood, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. And the truth is not in us. <clears throat> but notice, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If they say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. Notice it says, cleanse us from all unrighteousness. How are we cleansed? With the blood, nothing else, nothing even comes close. In Revelation 5, or excuse me, 1, 5, he says, And from Jesus Christ, the faithful witness, the firstborn of the dead, and the ruler over the kings of the earth, to him who loved us and washed us from our sins in his own blood. In the blood. We are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Now, humanly speaking, you tell somebody, well, you need to clean that up. You want a white garment? Put some blood on it. Let me ask you ladies. You got some dirty clothes? How many of you decide to dip those dirty clothes in blood? Anybody? No, you don't do that. But the blood of the lamb will take our garments and make them spotless. And we are that garment. You see, we're that temple that's talked about. Our bodies are the living temple of a holy God. And we are cleansed by the blood of the lamb. Not by Clorox, any kind of bleach. Not by washing them. With soap and water, we are cleansed by the blood of the Lamb. Revelation 5, 9 and 10, the Bible says, And they sang a new song, saying, You are worthy to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain and have redeemed us to God by your blood. Out of every tribe and tongue and people and nation, you have made us kings and priests to our God, and we shall reign on earth. Folks, our position in Christ, our work in the kingdom of God forever is because we've been redeemed by the blood of the Lamb. We've been redeemed because Jesus was willing to shed his blood so that we might have life. And then in Revelation 12, 11, the Bible says we're overcomers. And they overcame him, talking about the evil one, by the blood of the lamb, by the word of their testimony, and they do not love their lives even unto death. By the blood of the lamb. You see, we are not strong enough, smart enough in any way to stand up to Satan. He's too strong for us. He's too smart for us. But by the blood of the Lamb, he's defeated. He's a defeated foe. The war's over. Victory's been won. We sing about it all the time. We don't live like that many times, but we sing about it. But when Jesus shed his blood for us, our fighting was over. We've won the battle. Again, not because of our strength, but because the blood of the Lamb. And the third thing I want us to remember and think about this morning as we partake of the Lord's Supper is Luke chapter 24, 5 through 8, the empty tomb. Turn with me there. Luke chapter 24, just a couple of pages over. Verses 5 through 8. Then as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to him, Why do you seek the living among the dead. 
He is not here, but is risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day will rise again. You see, that's another thing we need to remember during this time. When we receive that little wafer of unleavened bread, it has virtually no taste. It's not soft. But it represents that broken body that was broken because of our sin. And we take that little red glass, it could be Kool-Aid, it could be anything, as long as we remember what it represents. It represents our understanding that the blood of Jesus cleansed us from sin. And as we drink it, it should remind us as it goes inside to remember that his blood cleansed us from all sin. Not most sin, not some sin, all sin forever, forever and ever and ever. But also remember, yes, his body was broken. His blood was shed. His body was killed and put in a, a tomb, a cool, dark tomb. But on the third day, he came out of that tomb. And one day, you and I will come out of our graves, wherever they are, if Jesus tarries. Now, he can come back today. And take all of us home in the rapture that have surrendered to him. And there's going to be a day where I don't know if the graves are going to pop open. I don't know how it's going to work or just a spirit come out and gets a new body. I don't know. All I know is if I'm there in the grave, I'll be there in the air. When Jesus comes back because he died, but he rose again. Just like you and I will physically die but we will rise again if we surrender our lives to him. I want to ask you this morning, do you remember? I want you to think back just a moment to that time in your life when you surrendered to him and realized he died for your sins. When you were made alive by his Holy Spirit. There may have been an excitement you haven't seen in 30, 40, 50 years. I want you to think about that. Is that something that you remember vividly? I can tell you, I remember the night that I thought about it the next morning when I surrendered my life to Christ around an old kitchen table. I remember that morning. It was a different day for me. My life had been changed. I didn't understand it. Now I do. I was made alive by the blood of the Lamb. I got eternal life by the blood of the Lamb. I will see heaven by the blood of the Lamb. My sins were paid for by His broken body. And I was cleansed by His blood. Would you stand with me? I want to pray for you. Then I want you to think about that. If you've lost that excitement, if... if this is just another routine time for you. I would encourage you to just come right down and kneel at these steps. You can call an altar, whatever you want to call it. Come sit on the front pew and just say, Lord, give me that excitement back. Give me that joy that I had that I lost some of. Father, as we stand before you, Father, our joy is tempered to some degree because we know that there are those who have lost that joy. They've lost the joy of their salvation. And Father, I pray that they'd be like David and they would say, restore to me the joy of your salvation. That they would look back on that day and remember the excitement they had, the peace they had, the great joy that was just incredible in their lives. And they would leave this place today not thinking about we had another Lord's Supper and we had a routine and the music was nice and, and all those things and the preacher got excited a time or two, but they would 
focus on you and on realizing that their sin was paid for by your broken body. Their garments were washed, but 